This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Good morning and aloha, everybody. My name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Law Across the Sea. And today we're going north to Alaska. My guest is David Case. David is an attorney and is the author of Alaska Natives and American Laws. It's in a book that's been highly regarded as the encyclopedia of the subject. It analyzes the historical application of federal law to indigenous peoples in Alaska. And it goes deeper. It goes very deep. For over 35 years, David represented Alaska Native interests, including Alaska Native village corporations, tribes, and rural municipalities. In 2011, David and his wife Dorothy retired to Hawaii. And he is now actively involved in outrigger paddling with the Keho Canoe Club and with the farming community with Hawaii Farmers Union United on the Big Island and other community activities. I've asked David to join me today to be my guest and to introduce us to Alaska Natives and American Laws. Good morning, David. Good to meet you here in Hawaii, and our backdrop uh, is your hometown, I think, or that's, your, your that's former right. hometown in, in yep. Anchorage, Anchorage, right? That's right. We lived there 38 years or so. Wow. It's a pleasure to be on the program, Mark. Thank you very much for inviting me. Well, well welcome. Uh, let's start off. Eh? Who are Alaska Natives? Who are the indigenous people of Alaska? Could well, you? they are the indigenous people of Alaska, <laughs> of course, okay. uh, and they used to be uh, at the time of the settlement of their claims in 1971, which we'll talk about, they used to be divided into generally uh, three categories, uh, Indians, uh, Eskimos, and Aleuts. Now, the names have changed over time because the indigenous peoples of Alaska have taken control of these names and uh, the descriptions of their places and their peoples. They have begun to, of course, use their own names. And uh, so, were those names of the federal government? Is that what? Uh, are those are those are just the those Indian Eskimo Aleuts are sort of the uh, anglicized, uh, uh, I will call it even colonial way of mm, uh, speaking of okay. uh, these people. Uh, keep in mind that uh, Indians didn't call themselves Indians uh, when Columbus uh, fetched up on Hispaniola. Uh, they had their own names for themselves. They still do. Right. Uh, and those names, the uh, Inupiat, Yupik, or uh, Aleut, uh, Alutik, uh, Athapaskan, uh, they all have their own uh, and, names. And they maintain those names. And they maintain states. those names. And each village will have its own name. Uh, you know, uh, Nunamut, Kayamut, uh, those names will be the village's names that are now being uh, used by the indigenous peoples. So instead of Anaktuvik Pass, it's, uh, it's Nunamut. Uh, and uh, that will uh, that means uh, the people of uh, the land, uh, Nunamut. Um, and uh, so a every village is beginning to develop its own uh, way of speaking of itself. And so there are various types of people, and they they have a relationship with the federal government of the United States. Can you explain well, what that is? Sure, it's it's c sort of the same relationship that uh, has evolved out of the United States Constitution and the common law for all indigenous people in the peoples in the United States. Um, interestingly, when I first was asked to write this book uh, by the Alaska Native Foundation uh, uh, 34 to 30 years ago or so, uh, the, the per common assumption was that there was no relationship with the Alaska Natives. There had been a settlement of their claims. W with respect to the... Yeah, with respect to their the relationship with the federal government. The federal government and Alaska Natives had no government to government relationship, which is, I'll talk about that yeah, in a bit, but yeah. the relationship essentially of indigenous peoples in America to the United States is one of one government or a group of governments, 500 governments, uh, to the United States of America, uh, the, the federal government. Okay. Um, so, and I'll get into why that is the case, but the assumption was that didn't exist in Alaska, hmm. that there was only a land claim settlement and there were no uh, governments in Alaska that had a, tribal governments, as they're called, that had a relationship with the federal government. Whose assumption was that? Uh, generally, the, the, the conventional wisdom, the federal governments, the states, everybody kind of assumed that. And uh, I was asked to, the Alaska natives didn't believe it. They believed they had a relationship. They and believed they had their own government-to-government -government relationship. Type. It had not been terminated or okay. it, uh, did not cease to exist simply because they were in Alaska. 
uh, and they uh, convene, convened a, hist a, a group of people to research lots of things. The programs have served them, and, and I was asked to re research the law. And I remember sitting in the Anchorage Law Library looking at these old cases uh, from the beginning of the 19th century and, and before as I read these federal cases describing the uh, engagement of the government with the Alaska Native villages and realizing, boy, these are tribes. The government has recognized them uh, forever. Wow. Uh, and uh, and there's, there's precedent for this at other places in America. The Pueblos were considered not to be, in Southwest America, were considered not to be indigenous peoples at about the same time, uh, and at the beginning of the 19th century, 20th century. And the uh, U.S. Supreme Court reversed that and concluded they were indigenous peoples, uh, in, uh, indigenous to the United States. And so I, I, I knew that that was, that was a precedent, and that was going to be applied here in Alaska. Uh, and sooner or later, uh, those villages, which were not federally recognized as having this government-to-government -government relationship, would be. And they were in 1998, I think it was. But um, back to the principles of Indian law, yeah. federal Indian law, as it's called. Mm -hmm. It grows out of uh, uh, one clause in the Constitution, the Commerce Clause, uh, which is Article 1, uh, Section 8, Clause 3 of the uh, United States Constitution, which grants Congress the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations among the several states and with the Indian tribes. Now, notice that in that grammatical context, with foreign nations and with Indian tribes, it's the same grammatical right. construct. Right. And, and, they, and they, among the several states is different. And, and, and so the Constitution acknowledges, yes, it seems it to me. Right. Is, is right. that what you're Right, that's what, what I'm saying. Right. And remember that at the time of the uh, Constitution was being written, and after the American Revolution, the Indian tribes were like independent nations. Right. Uh, and they were uh, on the borders of the United States. They were inside it. I uh, wasn't sure what to do about them. Uh, and they were allies for and against these foreign powers with the United States. There was a real difference in their uh, 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 distinction as, as, as nations. Or and, as, and, it, and it was contemporary. It was contemporary then, and right. And the people that wrote it yeah, knew about knew, it. knew that. That's right. That's exactly right. And, um, and then the United States, but that's just a few words in the Constitution. <laughs> it just says, it, it says what Congress can do. Right. It doesn't say anything about the rights of the indigenous doesn't people. doesn't go further. Yeah. Right. And of course, keep in mind that the, the natives also mentioned in the Constitution as uh, the Indians not taxed. So they were not citizens of the United States. That's the f underlying mm. of that phrase at mm. that time. Mm. So what was the relationship with these people going to be? And right. how was it going to be determined? Right. Well, it was determined in the courts by common law. And that, uh, by that I mean the law that is made out of the history that the courts review in dis deciding disputes. And are we're talking about federal courts. Federal courts. Okay. United States Supreme Court uh, issued three decisions in the between 1823 and uh, 1831. Uh, they're called the Marshall Trilogy, usually after uh, Justice John Marshall, who was the author, uh, which uh, laid out the basic principles that, as a matter of common law in, the, in America, would govern the relationship between the United States government and the indigenous peoples. Now, they weren't called indigenous peoples then. They were called Indians, and they lived in what was called tribes. Um, and John Marshall's conclusions were three. There were three conclusions. We'll try to get them briefly, as you know, there's 200 years of uh, law here. But uh, the first decision, uh, Johnson versus McIntosh, uh, held that Indians held title by Aboriginal title. They didn't really completely own the land, but they had the right to exclusive use and occupancy of it. The theory was that the discovering powers, an ethnocentric, Eurocentric uh, rule of law that mm -hmm. uh, benefits the Europeans had the right upon discovery to acquire the land from the indigenous peoples. The, and only they had the right. Mm. So the United States acquired, by the virtue of this decision, a monopoly on the right to acquire indigenous land. Until the United States exercised that right, there was an exclusive right of use and occupancy. And if you, or the third person, anybody, went on Indian lands without the United States having extinguished that title, you were in trespass. Okay. You could be sued and paid damages. So that's the basis for all these Indian land claims and the treaties and so forth going it's forward. It's based on power. It's based on power. Now, and let's also get clear here. This is the law, but let's not get confused between law and justice. Okay, good uh, point. This is not fair. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, many scholars and Indian people will tell you right now, it is not fair that the land could be taken right. uh, by one single party uh, and uh, nobody else had, had, a right to, uh, had a right to negotiate mm -hmm. with it. 
The other two cases, the Cherokee cases, uh, Cherokee Nation versus Georgia and Worcester versus Georgia, established that the indigenous people's uh, governments are separate governments. And they have a separate source of sovereignty from the United States and from the states. And that the United States can deal with those indigenous peoples and their governments as a, on a government-to-government -government basis, regulating commerce with the, uh, with the Indian tribes. Mm -hmm. And that is the entire basis for federal power over uh, in indigenous peoples in America. Uh, and the thing about it is, of course, it's common law. And common law can be changed by judges okay. uh, who reinterpret it. Right. So it's a, it's a very uh, malleable, ephemeral, malleable basis. Mm. And in the 19th century, uh, this little clause was interpreted by the courts as a matter of common law and constitutional law, too to grant the Congress plenary, complete, not absolute, but complete power over the field of Indian affairs. So whatever Congress did uh, was the law of the land. And then the Supremacy Clause kicks in and makes that the supreme law of the land, notwithstanding anything in the Constitution or laws of the courts of uh, the states to the contrary. So that makes any, th any federal law related to Indian indigenous peoples and their rights the supreme law of the land. Uh, and the relationship between the indigenous peoples and the United States is not a, a one of one race to another. It's a one of one group of governments or a government to the United States government. And, and that's the overall uh, yeah, law that's of the, of the overall United States umbrella principle with respect to indigenous yeah. pe and so, peoples. And, and right. So you could have distinctions, and the United States can pass laws that discriminate both for the good and the bad of indigenous peoples because it is not an invidious discrimination. It is a, ba a, a discrimination based on political status, the political relationship of these two uh, institutions, tribal governments and the federal government. And that's, that's the nexus, that's the connection. So you, indigenous peoples can have rights to subsistence and hunting and fishing that other people don't have, because not because they're uh, red people, but because they are members of tribal governments. Okay, now we have a, a couple minutes before our break, but with respect to the uh, rights present-day rights mm -hmm. of N Native Alaskans, indigenous people of Alaska, N indigenous peoples of Alaska. Right. What's the status? What can you? Right. There was a settlement of their land claims. So there's a, there's a claim of Aboriginal title, use and occupancy to all of Alaska. In 1971, Congress, exercising its plenary power under the Constitutional Commerce Clause, extinguished all the Aboriginal title in Alaska, and conveyed, in exchange for that extinguishment. 45 million acres of land, roughly 11% of the whole state of Alaska, surface and subsurface, as it's described in the statute, and a billion dollars uh, to pay for the rest. Now, this was supposed to be the most generous settlement in, <laughs> in American history. Yeah. You can do the math. Yeah. There are 365 million acres in Alaska. Yeah. Divide that into a billion, you get $3 an acre. Okay. It was a pretty good deal for the United States. Okay. Uh, and it not was a good, good settlement, a good negotiated settlement. Well, or, or, no, or, no, I mean, was know, it even a settlement? It was a settlement, and it was, and it was because Congress has the exclusive power to do this. Okay. They, they, they didn't ask for approval <laughs> from the indigenous people; they just did it, okay. uh, and sort of asked for approval afterwards. But it, it, the Congress doesn't need any authority, any, any okay. uh, anybody's approval it, yeah. to exercise plenary power. So that was the settlement. Uh, it's a long story. Uh, it, developed, it divided Alaska into 12, not tribes, corporations, and 200 village corporations in each of the villages. And they were conveyed all the land. The villages got the surface, the regions got the subsurface of the land. And then the regions, the 12 regions, uh, were to share the revenue they received from timber and the subsurface resources among all the 12 regions. So that provided a perpetual means of some money flowing through this system. 70%, though, of the revenues derived from those uh, resources had to be shared through all the 12 regions and down from the regions to the villages. And so you really had corporations here yeah. and uh, instead of tribes, yeah. if, if you will. Yeah. Uh, and I, I am, I'm beginning to learn a little bit about it as, as you tell us. Let, let's take a break. And when we come back, let's, I'd like to go a little bit further into what the, tr what the corporations do yeah. as compared to the, yeah. the lower 48s and maybe Hawaii. Yeah, and the tribes too. We'll talk about. I mean, there's, there's a very interesting history. About okay, that. we'll be yeah. right back. Okay. This is Think Tech Hawaii raising public awareness. Aloha, I'm Richard Concepcion, the host of Hispanic Hawaii. You can watch my show every other Tuesday at 2 p.m. 
we will bring you entertainment, educational, and also we tell you what is happening right here within our community. Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. But grandmother, what big eyes you have. She said. What are you doing? Research says reading from birth accelerates our baby's brain development. Push. Oh, Read aloud 15 minutes. Every child, every parent, every day. with Law Across the Sea, uh, north to Alaska. We're in, we're in Anchorage, as you can see, and we're talking with David Case. We're not really in Anchorage, but we're, we, got the, we got the Anchorage backdrop because that is what we're talking about. We're talking about Alaska. And David, you've been telling us about the way that the, uh, I guess, Congress decided to distribute some wealth, they, by virtue of its power, mm -hmm to the it, indigenous right. people of Alaska. And so the, reason, the reason that happened is for a little th because of a little thing called Prudhoe Bay. Uh, oil was discovered on Prudhoe Bay, but the aboriginal title to it hadn't been extinguished. And the, way the, and the pipeline corridors had aboriginal title uh, uh, burdened with it. So what happens if you take the oil out of the land and, and transport it across the pipeline and make lots of money on it? You're in trespass. And the potential trespass damages are all the profits. Mm. So there needed to be a settlement of these claims in order to get the oil out of Prudhoe Bay. Was there actually a law case? Uh, yeah, they law, sued. They, they, yeah, yeah. Uh, the native sued the, the, to stop the uh, pipeline and to, uh, uh, to prevent the uh, settlement of these claims without their uh, participation. Yeah. So, you know, you're telling me it's all about the money. And I was kind of hoping it was out of the, the goodness of the heart of the no, legislators no, in, in the Congress. No, it's all about the money. <laughs> okay. And so uh, what, what, what do these corporations mean? What, what does yeah. it, and well, how is it different from the Well, well first it's different because there are corporations, and the corporations are not governments. Mm -hmm. oh, the tribes okay. of the lower 48 are all governments on the reservations. Okay. And they govern the land, they control it, uh, they, they are the government, and the, the land ownership and control is unified with the government. The Claims Act separated the tribes in Alaska, which were not thought to exist, uh, from uh, the land and conveyed it to corporations, which are corporations controlled under the state of Alaska in most respects, the laws and the disclosures and so forth, uh, uh, meetings and proxy statements and all that are controlled by, the, by state law. But this is the, one of the important things. The, the resources were significant that right. were conveyed to the Alaska natives. As originally designed, the, class, the Claims Act was going to essentially terminate in 20 years and require the stock that the natives received in these corporations, these corporations that issued stock, yeah. but only to natives who were alive on the, on the, the date of the settlement, December 18th, 1971. Those are the only ones who got stock. I see. In 20 years, that stock was going to be, it was not, say, you could not alienate the stock. In 20 years, the restrictions were going to be taken off and anybody could buy the stock. And so at that point, anybody, Native corporations, uh, oil outside uh, businesses could buy the stock and acquire the land, mm. and it would all the natives would be all living on uh, somebody else's property. Well, that was stopped because the Alaska natives they learned how, in the course of the Settlement Act, in lobbying for it, how to mine Congress, and they were able to go back to Congress and get it changed. So now that the stock is perpetually protected, and the native lands are perpetually in their control. Okay. The corporations have been a significant players in Alaska's economy, especially the regional corporations. When we wrote the book in 2012, they generated about 25% of the gross domestic product of Alaska in businesses all over the world, about $10 billion a year. Uh, and the Indian tribes, in the meantime, have taken over the control of the health uh, system in Alaska hmm. for Alaska Native, the Native Health System. Okay. Built a new hospital and uh, have clinics in all the major hubs and village, village clinics, and they operate all the Native, the Natives operate that, separate from the Claims Act. But this is a, a thing that was made possible. Through the money that... Uh, no, okay. no, not through no? the Claims Act money. This is a separate money oh. that is available through, for Indian Health Services and BIA and... The, oh, I and see. Uh, four years after the Claims Act, the uh, Congress passed the Indian Self-Determination Act, which required, required the government to contract for its services with 
tribes and groups of tribes willing to take it over. And in the course of the settlement, the Alaska Natives villages had organized themselves as nonprofit corporations, 12 regional nonprofit corporations, right. controlled by tribes, which then took over these programs. I see. Now, now I, w I want to ask you, though, you, you, you see how the corporations have run, mm -hmm. and how does it compare to the lower 48 and, the, and Hawaii? I mean, well, you know, you're talking about uh, different, different things entirely, mm -hmm. really, in many mm -hmm. ways. Yeah. I mean, the lower 48 has good examples of tribal governments, and it has tribal governments that don't work so well. The same thing in Alaska. You'll find the corporations work. Some most work very well. Some don't. You know, it's it's a, it's a, it's a human institution. Right. Um, but the thing about the Claims Act is it separated the tribes from the land. That's the important thing to realize here. So the mm -hmm. corporations now have the land. The tribes are what? Yeah. Uh, and it took 20 years of litigation uh, to conclude that an, an, an administrative action by the in Department of the Interior to recognize if Indian tribes in Alaska as tribes. And uh, that occurred with a woman named Ada Deer, who had led the Menominee uh, uh, independence movement uh, when she became Secretary of Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs. She uh, recognized the Indian tribes in Alaska. But in the meantime, court cases were going on to determine if, as a matter of common law, the tribes existed in Alaska. And about the same time, they reached the conclusion in the federal courts and even the state court, finally, uh, that the tribes in Alaska continued to exist. So, so you have both corporations and tribes. and tribes. The tribes do not have any land. So there's a question of what jurisdiction do they have. Right. And the Alaska, the United States Supreme Court in 1998, if that's correct here, I think, um, held that there was no Indian country in Alaska where the tribe, no reservation. So there was no connection between the tribe mm -hmm. and the land right. for jurisdictional purposes. Right. The very next year, the Alaska Supreme Court reversed 20 years of its own precedent and held that Alaska and examined 200 years of common law precedent and concluded that without land, Alaska Native villages as tribes still had jurisdiction over their children. Okay. And then we begin from there, what else do they have jurisdiction over? Uh, and that's... Uh, where, where does that lead? Well, we where? don't know. It's the common law. Oh, so it, it takes a while to figure it out. <laughs> and their cases are still being uh, ongoing. I see. Uh, and the Alaska Supreme Court has uh, generally uh, afforded uh, more, more power than every time they've been asked to the uh, tribes in Alaska to adjudicate child welfare matters, uh, adjudicate adoptions for their children. Uh, we don't know what, to what extent they have jurisdiction over members and non-members for marriages and so forth. But there are, you know, it's being extended out. How do you know if you're in a tribe? How, how, how the do tribe you determine? Will tell you. How do you know if you're, how do you know if you're an American citizen? <laughs> I mean, it's the same. Your government tells you whether you are a citizen or not. Okay. The tribe tells you whether you are a citizen or not of their tribe. They were able to determine that yeah. some sort of historical well, perspective it's, it's, or uh, no, it's 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 their law. Tribes uh, can make their own okay, law as okay. to who will be a member of their tribe, and the United States doesn't participate in that. Okay. Uh, it's not reviewable in the United States courts. Are, are Alaska Natives also uh, citizens of the United States? Yes. Uh, in 1924, before 1924, no Indians were citizens of the United States unless they had met the, the test of some various civilization statutes that would have been passed. Uh, in 1924, all indigenous peoples in, in America became citizens of the United States under the General Citizenship Act. Okay. And so Alaska Natives are citizens. Yes. Wow. But they are also citizens of two countries, essentially, the United States and a, a, another government called their, their tribal government. With respect to uh, the reservation issue, just how, how does that compare with the rest of the tribes in, in the United States or the rest of indigenous peoples? Uh, is, that, is that a good thing? I mean, it, it seems... Well, it's a thing. <laughs> I'm not going to say whether it's good or bad. I mean, uh, that is the structure in the uh, lower 48 generally to have a reservation, which has the effect of combining the tribal government, as I said before, with the land and the resources. And that is uh, potentially a good thing because you have your, your uh, ge geographic jurisdiction uh, as well as any other jurisdiction that might arise out of the, uh, the tribe itself, over jurisdiction over its own members, as I mentioned before for the Alaska uh, tribes. Um, but the problem is resources. And what the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act did, it, developed, it delivered capital yeah, yeah. and resources to people who generally don't get it, don't get access to capital mm -hmm. and resources. And in a capitalistic democracy, that is the key to having power and participation in the government, in the democracy. You have to have capital or access to it. And the Alaska Natives got that 
and made it count. I mean, it was tough work. They, they, these corporations were mm -hmm. on the skids mm -hmm. for the first t 10 or 15 years mm -hmm. and figuring out how to, how to operate them. Uh, but they have uh, they've done it. And uh, these, uh, the regional corporations in particular uh, have significant economic power uh, and political power within the state. We have a couple minutes left, and I want to just briefly mention a man that, that you mentioned in, in your book, yeah. Bartolome de, de las, las Casas. Casas. Yeah. Who was he? Uh, and tell me a little bit about him, because he seems to be important for, for some, some reason. Right. Well, <laughs> I was just amazed that I discovered, uh, I began to research about him, and I didn't intend to do it. But I started to look into his life in this book. Bartolome, Bartolome de las Casas was a uh, Spaniard, a, a boy of about nine or ten when, when Columbus came back from the New World uh, in, into Sevilla in Spain. And his father, Las Casas' father, knew Columbus. Anyway, long story. Las Casas went over to the New, the new World as a, uh, as a, 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 a counter media. He had a control of uh, Indians and they worked for him as slaves, basically. But, uh, and he was also being trained as a priest. And he became a priest, a Dominican friar, uh, but he would accompany the Spanish through their conquests. In Cuba, he witnessed a, a, a massacre of an Indian village of men, women, and children, and it flipped the switch. Uh, and he just, he renounced uh, all of the Spanish uh, control of those people in that way and uh, began to uh, uh, argue that all people are one, all mankind is one, these people have rights to land and should be treated fairly. And so you, in your book, you find him important because of the way he approaches indigenous peoples throughout the world and, and, and what he said was, was what, what he says. Yeah, all mankind is one. All and, mankind uh, is one. And these, everybody should be treated the same. All mankind has rights. And that is, is important not for just indigenous people. For everybody. As it came to the, mm. into the 20th century and the UN developed a, the Charter of Human Rights, Las Casas' thought was brought into it. It had been lying dormant for 500 years or so. And, uh, and the, the, the Spanish uh, governments in South America, who had been influenced by these thoughts for many years, got this and incorporated into the uh, UN, UN Charter. All men are the created equal. Created equal. Or all yeah. mankind is one. That's all what, how he said, all mankind you know, is one. Uh, that's a good way to close our program today, and we could certainly use it a lot sure. in our day and age, even today. There's words to live by. <laughs> good words to live by. David, thank you so much for being my guest today. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha.